Hello, I'm Lulu Creel, Senior Vice President and Chairman Latin American here at Sotheby's. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this special event, which is part of Art Forum at Sotheby's, a partnership that brings audiences live conversations around the globe about contemporary art and its context. Today, Art Forum at Sotheby's will explore the, SP, the exhibition, Northern Exceptions, Contemporary Art in Mexico, currently on view at the Museo Jumex in Mexico City. Normal Ex Exceptions is a thematic survey of contemporary art in Mexico over the past 20 years, drawing primarily from the collection Humex with additional works by invited artists and collaborators. The exhibition fills the entire museum with more than 20 works by artists based in Mexico, including those of international origins and Mexican artists living and working abroad. Art Forum and Sotheby's are, are delighted to highlight the often overlooked exceptions of Mexican art that deserve to be placed in the, expo in the spotlight. We're honored to have a panel of fantastic guests speaking today to explore the exhibition of contemporary art in Mexico. Eugenio Lopez, the president of the Fundación Jumex and owner of Colección Jumex, Keith Hammonds, chief curator of Museo Jumex, and two of the artists featured in the exhibition, Melanie Smith and Mario Garcia Torres. And now we shall see a short video from the inside the exhibition before hanging over to the director of the Kunst Institute Many in Rotterdam, Sofia Hernandez Choncuy, moderator of our event today. Hello everyone, I'm Sofia Hernandez Choncuy, director of Kunst Institut Meli in Rotterdam. I'm joining you from the Netherlands this evening here. Today we're spotlighting the exhibition Normal Exceptions, Contemporary Art in Mexico, on view at Museo Humex until August 15th. The show proposes a dialogue between emerging and renowned artists who turn their attention to overlooked places, people and narratives, challenging traditional conceptions of art and social history. Normal Exceptions is part of Museo Humex's year-long series of exhibitions highlighting works from artists in Mexico in dialogue with the renowned collection Humex, Colección Humex, one of the leading collections of Mexican art and one of the most significant private collections of contemporary art in Latin America. To discuss the exhibition, as well as the development of Mexican contemporary art over the past two decades, I'm delighted to have with me four extraordinary speakers. Joining us from Paris, we have Eugenio Lopez Alonso. Eugenio is a pioneer of contemporary art collecting in Mexico. In 2001, he created the Fundación Humex Arte Contemporáneo, of which he is president. The creation of the Museo Humex in 2013 has further established Lopez's influence in the international cultural landscape. Welcome, Eugenio. Thank you very much. Thank you. And joining us from Mexico City, we have Kit Hammonds, the chief curator of Museo Humex, where he leads the artistic public programs and public programs. His major exhibitions at the museum have included Normal Exceptions, Contemporary Art in Mexico, which we will be discussing today, as well as James Turrell, Passages of Light from 2019, Scripted Reality, The Life and Art of Television of 2018, among other exhibitions. Hello, Kit. Hi there. 
Also in Mexico City, we have Melanie Smith. The artist uh, Melanie was born in England in 1965. She lives and works between Mexico City and London. Her work is in diverse media, reflects on the extended field of painting oh, nice. within the history of oh, art cool. and its entanglement with the moving image. Her work is concerned with the relationships between the city, body, archaeology, tragic comedy, and nature. She has exhibited at numerous institutions, including PS1 in MoMA in New York, Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, Tate Britain, Tate Liverpool, and Tate Modern in London. Oh, no, and 2001, she represented Mexico at the first 54th Venice Biennale. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Mario Garcia Torres, uh, who's connecting from Bodrum in Turkey. Mario's artistic practice has explored time, truth, and history as concepts. He uses painting, video, sound, and performance as means of expression. Born in Monclova, in Coahuila, which is in the north of Mexico, he currently works between Los Angeles and Mexico City. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His work has been exhibited at the Walker Art oh, Center yeah, in yes, Minneapolis. Yes, yes, yes at the Contemporary Art Center of Brussels, the Tamayo Museum in Mexico City, and the Biennales of Berlin, Sao Paulo, and Venice, including Porto Alegre, among many others. Hello, Mario. Hi there, hi. hi. Uh, well, thank you uh, for all joining us from wherever you're connecting. Uh, I'm just gonna explain a little bit about the formats tonight. This event will run for about an hour. Towards the end, we'll be taking your questions, which you can start submitting now. Underneath the video screen, you will see a web form where you can enter your name and your question. This, to submit your question, please enter your details and click submit. So that is it. Uh, we're going to begin uh, this evening uh, with a conversation. Uh, in fact, uh, I wanted to ask Eugenio if we could start with him. Uh, Eugenio. The Colección Humex, which you founded, is a phenomenal collection containing works by artists as Damien Hirst, Andy Warhol, Gabriel Orozco, and Marcel Duchamp. What prompted you to start collecting art? Well, this comes from a long time ago. I always, I liked art and, uh, but not since I was, uh, yeah, I, I, when I was 14, 15, 16, uh, not in, in university. I, I wanted to be a, 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 a. I never wanted to. I was terrible for mathematics, and uh, when I went to choose well, what I wanted to study, I just I, I wanted to be a lawyer because there was no algebra, and there was nothing to elevate to the square, and I was terrible for that. So. Basically, that's how I chose my, my, my education because I suffered so much in high school. Uh, believe me, it was really bad. And I, I didn't finish, And then, but I always knew that I was going to be in the company, in the family business. Mm -hmm. And I started with on marketing and... Um, in the creative things. Little by little, I started, uh, I met someone in Los Angeles, Stella Provost. Then I, I opened a gallery in Los Angeles, but it was more than being an art dealer. I wanted to be a collector because I discovered incredible artists and my world start changing completely. And I owe so much to so many people who very uh, generously uh, museum directors, curators, because I, uh, it was the first time in my life that I had passion for something, that uh, I liked something very, very much. Of course, it was not that the business, the family business, uh, and, I, I did not like it, but uh, but I start. The only way you can be good at something is when you love something. And um, I remember that I went to an auction at Sotheby's for, for the first time, and I was at the very back, and I saw that I saw all the 
boards and other people on the telephones and other people sitting there and coming out from 72nd Street all the way to 57th Street, I was thinking and thinking and I said, this is serious and I have to learn it. I have to learn uh, why. And I started with, and that's how. One question takes it to the other one. And uh, and people think, think that, oh, for him it was very easy. His family gave him the money. No, 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 no. It was very difficult to convince fam a family who's never collected and uh, to have the works of art. I loved, I loved the pieces of art. I was crazy about it. when I see something that I loved, uh, uh, I, there was nothing else that I wanted more than the piece of art, regardless of, of, of how much is it that I've been 20 years. Of course, you have to be aware of, of, of the price, no? But it was, this was 1994. But then I realized that I have to grow up with people of my own generation. And then I saw Sachi's collection, and then I saw the Pond Foundation, and I saw Chase Manhattan Bank collection. And then I said, oh, in Latin America, there's never been a collection uh, open to the public. That way I can buy the things I love, but it was for the love of the pieces. And, and, and I realized that there was not an international collection in Mexico which is nothing wrong. But that was my, my goal, to do something international. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a wonderful response about the importance of learning something that you're passionate about and not just uh, going with the flow, but identifying how that passion is directed. I, uh, I love this and we've been learning, everyone here in this uh, round table, a conversation online. We've all been learning about contemporary art along the way with you. We're from a pretty much a, a the same or like the same generation. I want to now turn to Kit uh, because for sure the uh, opening of Musa Humix uh, took a different twist from the wonderful exhibition space at the juice factory of Humix before that in the city of Ecatepec, just in the outskirts of Mexico City. And uh, maybe we turn to Kit and uh, yeah, the chief curator of Museo Humex, now an established institution with a, its own storage and registers and team that can not only collect, but also care for the collection and invite the public. So tell us first a, about the exhibition that you have on view right now. We really want to hear about that in specific. And, and just first of all, the name of the exhibition is very intriguing. Why is it called Normal Exceptions? Uh, um... So yeah, uh, when we embarked on considering how to represent what is a very diverse and uh, exciting period of art in Mexico, uh, we were reluctant to um, write history at this moment, I suppose. And so we tried to think about how to consider history within the exhibition differently and adopted this term normal exceptions from the discipline of micro history mm -hmm. that looks at um, the lives of individuals and of particular events as a way to uh, bring out the narrative of a particular time and moment. Mm -hmm. And so one of our ideas was to adopt this term, not strictly follow this historical model, but uh, in order to place attention on the artist's work and artists who themselves are investigating particularities uh, in a way to reflect outwards um, the issues that we all face in, over the, in this century, I suppose, the last 20 years. For sure, and microhistory is such an interesting uh, way to approach uh, the exhibition and also the importance of oral histories and project-based work, research-based uh, artistic work. A great, great curator criteria. Now tell me, one of the important elements of the exhibition is that it does it just doesn't focus solely on artists of Mexican origin, uh, but instead on artists working in Mexico uh, and includes also some foreign born artists that uh, for whom Mexico is a large part of their practice, an important part of their practice. It includes as well Mexican artists who are living abroad 
and uh, working there and not in uh, the country. So how did you choose to define Mexican art when beginning the process of forming such exhibition? And how did this uh, choices influence the artists that you chose to feature? Well, I think we, we chose to feature around these kind of thematic approach or process-based practices that would be, would be able to encompass a broad variety of activities. Um, there's work painting, photography, installation, action-based work. Um, and yeah, a decision we made as well as, as the title suggests, contemporary art in Mexico was a way to sort of broaden this discourse and reflect a time that um, in reality, the, what might be seen as Mexican art practices have become very internationalized and opened up and a greater deal of attention is being placed on Mexico as a place to come and to live and work by, in, uh, well, a cosmopolitanism uh, has emerged here, which um, seemed important to reflect within the exhibition. And actually the history of art in the last 20 years, we have Melanie here, for instance, um, well, more than 20 years in Mexico, has uh, always had that cosmopolitan thread. So we were interested in um, focusing on that rather than defining necessarily uh, what Mexican art could be. Well, that's uh, something to explore as well, the term cosmopolitanism and its relationship to art history, how it's been read as a term across time. But look, let's go to the exhibition. You've chosen a selection of artists uh, from the exhibition to discuss here with us this evening. And I would like to see if you could tell us about them as we see their work on the screen. Sure. I just wanted to highlight a particular thread in relationship to um, the thematic of how, how we explore history and how things are registered in history. Uh, this first work we're seeing is by Jorge Satore. Um, just as a preface as well, the exhibition included a number of rotating rooms. So it's not, it wasn't purely a static exhibition. And we'll see some of those projects that were part of the show within this. And Jorge's was one example. Uh, in this project, Los Negros, uh, Jorge directly analyzed microhistory, uh, returned to the site of the first microhistorical book by Carlos Ginsberg met the author, and in this image you see the artist uh, meeting the author, uh, drawn by a, uh, what do I call them, a court illustrator for legal trials. They're again related to this history. And what Jorge was interested in was identifying visual or material elements that actually fall outside even microhistorical study, because they're not written down. So the one focus was to look at the materials, um, such as the following image, which shows uh, a number of brick sculptures um, derived from motifs in the town of, uh, in Italy, where this original book was based. Uh, and a further artist um, if, uh, was Raul Ortega, uh, who, as you mentioned, is Mexican, um, however, lives in New Zealand. And this project, uh, which is a video work shown for the first time here, is a phono archaeology where uh, um, Raul entered into an area of Montserrat that had been covered by a, by a volcanic eruption it, and particularly a sound recording studio and was recouping the sound from lost records, uh, LPs and tapes, which form the soundtrack to this um, video portrait. Uh, this idea of archaeology as being one means of uncovering the lives of individuals was a kind of a leitmotif among the selection of works. Uh, and sometimes that was enacted by artists such as Gitti Palizzi, who I think we'll see in the next image. Uh, and in some ways, Terce Un Quinto, um, the image at the top, who, where removal and excavation are an action to um, to inscribe things into history. We'd normally think of an inscription as an addition. In this case, a removal begins to inscribe things into history. And um, G.T. Polizzi's work, it's actually directly related to the history of the museum. It was made for the exhibition and the shape cut out of the gallery walls is the silhouette of all the works that are ever, ever 
been hung in that place within the museum. So it has an overlay of um, Franz Erhard Walter, John Baldassari, Elora Calzadilla that make up this outside form. Uh, another act, part of the exhibition on our first floor, we produced a we've been producing a series of projects that invited not artists, but organizations to participate in the show. Uh, in this case, the first project was with Soma, which is an independent artist founded art school, who produced a series of um, collective workshops and research into the area around the museum, using the gallery space as both a meeting place a, um, and a print room. And they produced at the end of that project a risograph book, collectively authored, that tells something of the personal experience of the area, the new development in which um, Humex sits. And finally, um, as to talk a little bit more about how um, history might be explored in a different way through artistic means, this current project by Insight, uh, an organization that was founded on the border of San Diego and Tawana, commissioning artwork, um, used the, uh, the space uh, for a performance um, based on their own archives. Uh, the script is written from quotation from artists and critics who are discussing public space. And it's performed daily by two dancers who respond to the script through um, movement. So in, in addition to the, if you like, static exhibition, we've tried to incorporate an ongoing dialogue with how artistic research might contribute towards this idea of reflecting on the moment, both uh, artistic moment and cultural and historical. Fantastic. Uh, you've uh, presented at least a uh, beautiful artworks, but also these two wonderful organizations, Soma and Insight, of which I am a dear fan. And now Melanie, uh, who's with us, as well as Mario, are two of the artists featured in the exhibition at Museo Humex. Uh, why don't we begin with Melanie and uh, I don't know, hear a little bit about uh, her work in the exhibition, Parre Cero, uh, which is in uh, Museo Humex now on display. Tell us, Melanie, how is this work connected to the ideas of space in urban life and in, to Mexico in particular? Um, well, actually, um, Paris is a place which is just outside uh, Mexico City. It's just on the periphery between um, Cuernavaca and, um, and Mexico City. And it's a really sort of small settlement where um, very few people um, are about during the day. You know, it's a very kind of abandoned place where um, there's a lot of uh, houses as there are many uh, small towns over Mexico where people, you know, are, are the kind of their own architects of the houses, um, doesn't really kind of have a center, it's a bit sprawling. Um, and uh, the, the, the video, which you see in the left-hand corner is, um, it's really like a, a sort of 16 millimeter um, uh, animation uh, as a kind of portrait of the, of the place itself. And then there's this wall, um, a kind of concrete wall, like many of the concrete walls, which you find in these, in these towns and behind it, there's this painter, painting. Um, which is a kind of also another kind of portrait of Paris. So I, I was thinking as it's really kind of present in a lot of my works about um, my own relationship to abstraction and how that really changed when I went to Mexico. <clears throat> you know, previously I'd been really interested in minimalism. So I was kind of thinking of this wall almost like, or spatially, kind of like uh, the monochrome um, or a monochrome that, um, uh, which is actually blocking in this case, the view of the painting behind. And the monochrome for me in sort of westernized terms is, um, uh, is a kind of a window through which you look onto to something through, you know, sort of looking onto nature or looking onto spiritualism. And in this case, it's you, you, you're denied that view. So you always have to kind of look around the back of things. And this is a lot of what my work's about is kind of, you know, challenging these different histories of art. You know. 
that's a that's a very good introduction to the work and I think also it's to your practice which really involves mm. from painting and film and uh, mm. I really I really want us, uh, you to talk about about your work called Silitla Dismantle. Yeah. And uh, this is a, a work that has traveled all over the world and uh, that actually I got to see uh, in different places including here in Rotterdam at the Boymans mm. Museum. Can you please Open us mm. up it, to this beautiful work of yours, which is, yeah, complex and also... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this one kind of, you know, it, it, it describes again my, my interest in the, 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 you know, the pictorial plane, which you hear quite, quite easily. With the, This is a mirror which um, gets carried through the garden, um, which is um, a, uh, a garden... Um, built by Edward James, who was um, a patron of the arts, very much associated with the Dadaists and Surrealists. And he came to Mexico and built these garden from over 20 years from 1960s, 1980s. Um, and they were, he built these sort of oniracle structures, stairways, which kind of led to nowhere. They're all out of cement. Here you can see one in this slide. And um, he used the whole town to, uh, he employed the whole town to make these structures. And they're very much, you know, thinking about sort of emotional architecture. And I think the interesting thing for me in the project was that he was thinking that these um, structures over time would be reclaimed by nature. So I was really interested in this sort of entropic sense of nature crumbling back into uh, or, or the structures crumbling back into nature. So my film really is a kind of um, a very fragmented or dismantled vision, which comes from a sort of constellated, um, many different references throughout the history of art and um, has, as I say, this mirror as its sort of central protagonist where the mirror is kind of reflecting back the landscape itself. So I was really thinking in, in terms of kind of critiquing this, sort of the idea of the exotic landscape, why James came in the first place to set up this place way away from the center and virtually for himself. So there's many kind of dismantled and fragmented stories that come into play in the, in the video. Yes, it's really a beautiful film. And Edward James, having come to Mexico and you having investigated him, is a part of the research practice also that is shared between you and Mario very beautifully that you go on to really write and uh, or rewrite the histories of these places and artists uh, that are hidden somewhere or that haven't been fully revised. And to really think about it so reflectively, not only through the mirror, but also through thinking of the medium of art, which brings me to asking Mario about his work in the exhibition at Museo Humex now. Uh, your work is the painting is missing, the painting has been found, and it's a, an artwork that is concerned with the art worlds and it considers the notion of what types of art are actually valued and which aren't uh, through society and by its institutions. Can you explain a little bit about the process behind this creation? We're going to see some of the images of this artwork uh, as an installation. Yeah. Well, this piece is uh, it's a piece I made in 2008, I think, so it's a little bit... Uh... Um, slightly uh, early work, I'd say. Uh, it's, it was done, I don't know, like 15 years ago. And uh, it, it started, I mean, I, how to explain this? I mean, I think that I should give a little bit of a context. I think that from the, I think I, I belong to a generation of, of people who were, we grew when, when conceptual art started to be um, analyzed and reviewed and, and finally um, it was a moment that those ideas from the 60s and late 60s and 70s started to be distributed. And, and we as a world uh, really understood the, 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 the scope of those ideas. And I think that's so why I grew up uh, uh, thinking about this and, and being, being very influenced by that. And, uh, and, and one thing that really through reading and through understanding that those kind of positions in the art world, I, I, I got to... Um, to understand and to be a passionate a fan, a fanatic. I'm an artist, but I'm also a fanatic about art, and uh, and and that led me to precisely to 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 what Kit was saying before, to the minor histories, to the la tiny little details in our history, and, and mainly in the conceptual art history. 
So I was, uh, at the time, during those years, I was really uh, trying to research and trying to investigate out of very, uh, without the intention of making works. It was mainly about uh, trying to, uh, to investigate and to understand what was happening in tiny little moments. So every time that there was a line in a book that said something funny and that didn't, that wasn't developed, I was, you know, calling people and writing people and trying to understand this, this whole thing. And at some point <clears throat> throughout this research, I started to understand that there was these gaps in history. And so I spent a number of years sort of looking at those gaps and trying to think about them and, and, and sort of reviewing them in, in, in some other works that so one of them we, we, we might see later, I think. Uh, but in that, in that moment of looking at, at, uh, at the gaps, I, I understood uh, that uh, Ed Rocher, which was an artist that I, was, I, I really uh, appreciated. And I, at some point in, 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 their, in his career, they started to make a catalog resume uh, of his work. Mm -hmm. And through that process, they published, or, or I realized myself that there were some works that he had done, sorry, that, that that, uh, that, that, that did, they didn't know, or he didn't know, his studio didn't know where they were. So I was really intrigued about this, like what, what happens, you know, what happens with, with works when, when we lost a work of art? What is that, does that work exist? You know, what, what does it mean? You know, like what, uh, do, does the work still exist? Or, you know, this kind of, it brought me to like funny little questions, like, which were very conceptual questions about, about the art world and, 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 and fundamental questions about art. And so I, so I, I, I started to think, okay, well, maybe I should recreate this and, and create the ghost of those works that were lost. But maybe they are not destroyed. Maybe they are somewhere, but just we don't know where they are. And so I, I, I got to this idea to, to recreate the paintings. Uh, so I, I created the size, each, each of the paintings that were lost, I recreated in a canvas. I didn't repaint the painting as Ed Rocher had done, but I just put the title on it. So what we're looking at is just white canvases, canvases that have been painted white and they only have the title of the work that had been lost. And, but by the time, but when I started doing this, I mean, and I think uh, maybe Keith can tell us how many they are, I, I forgot now, but it's, I don't know, like 30 something works that were lost. And, but I started painting these things. And at some point during the process, I realized that they actually had found some. And, and so I, I had to split up and make, it, make two works out of one. And uh, so now it's two works. And some of them, one group is, is called, is the title of the work is this painting has been, is missing. And the other group is called this painting has been found. So every time that a new work is found, it moves from one group to the other so that's how that 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 piece came about that's a that is a, something that is funny if you're not working in the insurance companies or as registrars in museums of course uh, but i do think that it, it does stem not only from ed Rocher, but for sure from the very basic uh, propositions of solid wheat and conceptualism that the artist uh, is a mystic and that does not uh, he or she they do not provide information uh, or they are to provide information, but not to instruct, say, its audience. And I think that those are essential aspects of your work. And it's not just about the art object or artists that you are investigating through microhistories, as Kid has said, but you also study a artistic practice in large, conceptualism being one type or modality of work, uh, where speech, uh, the speech act uh, actually is quite important wherever it is had. So, a major theme is this, the, uh, the questioning of artistic practice in itself, and you employ both modern and contemporary art history to not only uh, review, but as an actual resources to establish a relationship be between the past, the present, and also possible futures. To this end, uh, you often reenact uh, some of the other artists' work or draw on archival footage uh, as the primary source of material for your own work. And we have a short excerpt here of one of your works, Falling Together in Time. Uh, here it is, I want us to watch it uh, for a bit uh, and then ask you a, a question or two, Mario, about this work. Life is very much linked to coincidences. One could argue life is made of them. You just really have to be aware in order to recognize them. Sometimes though, 
I think it might be connected to liminal moments. Awareness, I mean. When things are about to happen, time slows down and synchronicity becomes visible. My friend Renee once told me, until you lose all your money in Vegas, you don't see all the other losers. They are all there, all the time, but they are just invisible until then. Once you tune in, coincidences appear one by one. Let me tell you a little story. So we have a scene, just a very small bit of falling together in time. Uh, Mario, tell us a bit of what you wish to convey uh, to the audience through this film. Oh, well, I wish we could, we could see it all because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to explain. Uh, put it on uh, YouTube, compadre, just uh, put it there. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I okay. can. I, maybe they, 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 I don't know if I can because of- uh, uh, Copyright? Uh, copy, yeah. Copyright, copyright yeah. issue. Uh, but it's a video that it's a, it's well it's made out of uh, YouTube videos. It's a, it's a more recent work. It's a work I made maybe a couple of years ago, um, and it's an essay made out of uh, so as as the same as you were talking about in terms of uh, researching and, and reenacting uh, works of art. I've also sort of considered many other sort of cultural productions as part of that same research. And, and one case has been uh, sort of leveling out uh, cultural production in terms of like not, not looking differently at pop culture, for example, uh, music and, and things like that, or literature or theater or whatever. And in this case, uh, it's a video that I started to, to build uh, because I wanted to talk about liminal moments, what it means uh, to, to be in a liminal moment. I think I was in one. And I was trying to understand that, what it means to change your life in some radical way. And I started to look into that and I realized that um, I could do an, an essay or an idea and explain an idea that was less about liminal moments and it was more about coincidences. I realized that there was a number of people who had been through liminal moments and in those liminal moments, there was a number of connections through them. So it's, that's why I think it's really difficult to explain because it's a video that connects crazy uh, facts, crazy stories. Like in, uh, the main issue in the video is a song written by uh, the group Van Halen, American group uh, Van Halen. And the song is called Jump. And it turns out that Jump was, you know, it's, it's, it connects Jump with uh, the last fight of, of Muhammad Ali. And it connects Jump with uh, uh, the creation of a synthesizer that then was later used by, by Madonna. And, and, and it, it draws a number of information that leads to the fact that to understand why a song like that was created, what, what information brought uh, the, the band to publish this song. It was about a liminal moment or, or people believed that it was about jumping, about killing yourself and, and what it meant. So it's a very, it's a very complex um, video. I don't know. Maybe I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> I think no. I think you are, and I think that it connects very well to the idea of gap that you investigate in art history, and also to the jumps or the leaps of faith that art and culture at large uh, have manifested into passionately taking up on a role, whether it's collecting or making art or investigating an idea. And I think that we do many jumps when we also immerse ourselves into a new context. And this is where I think uh, the presentation or participation of Melanie and you in the exhibition uh, at Museo Humix is quite relevant uh, to speak about today. Uh, neither of you, uh, Melanie or Mario, neither of you are from Mexico City and uh, have lived and worked there uh, or here, I should say, but say uh, I'm not there either. Uh, how has Mexico City influenced your artistic practice? Because I think that that really is a jump from where you're coming from to come to uh, that uh, urban jungle of sorts. Uh, mm. Melanie, why don't we start with you? And uh, you know, as a British artist coming or entering into the Mexican art scene a couple of decades back, uh, how has this country impacted your work? Oh, I mean, hugely, without doubt. You know, as I was saying earlier, I was really, uh, I suppose my art education was all about abstraction, minimalism. And so when I came to Mexico, um, you know, that sort of um, idea really got turned on its head to sort of like 180 degrees. And yeah. I was really kind of fascinated 
I think with um, with the Baroque, um, just you know that kind of the way of um, just how things are presented in Mexico City, um, you know um, that that kind of Baroque overflowing modernity, which is always um, kind of been present, I think, over the, the last few years in, mm-hmm. in my in my work. And I think another big factor, um, which kind of you know um, came into playing over the over the over the years, was this idea of working with distance. You know, um, if you look at my work, there's a lot of um, helicopter shots. There's a lot of distances from above. There's a lot of distances, um, um, you know, from Fordlandia, from um, Maria Elena, which are two videos I've been working on recently. So um, there's a lot to do with the idea of distance. And I think this in the, the latest project, which I did um uh, actually before the pandemic was um, filmed in two places, again, all about distance. And it was a reenactment of William Blake's The Circle of the Lustful. Um, and the performers were in Amuak and I was directing from um, the Museo Amparo. So it was a kind of this idea about, um, you know, giving back, kind of, you know, giving over directorship a bit, looking at things from afar. Um, and I think one of the things that, Blake really um, is really good at telling us is this, you know, he he's really sucks us into somehow in the, into the idea of the human condition and pain and anguish um, and urban paranoia, you know. So I was looking really with this with this project at how his illustration um, somehow defamiliarizes itself in different cultural contexts. So, you know, Blake for us is huge in our imaginary and that memory of the painting is also really huge for British people. So in this case, I was looking at, um, with CCTV cameras, um, like who were, we were kind of filmed from afar and seeing how the virtual space, the performative space kind of, um, mesh together with the painterly space. So I think we can hear, see a little bit of the, the, the clip from how, uh, this is an, actually an edited clip afterwards, this became a film. So um, how these bodies were making, again, these, these sort of very fragmented but Baroque kind of um, juxtapositions of each other. Uh, that's a very beautiful connection of, a, of an artist in the UK, William Blake, who not only uh, does it allow you to speak about vortex and the importance of distance, but also for sure the experience of COVID-19 and the distance mm-hmm. that we all had to take. And, you know, mm. William Blake's gallery set the date, uh, Britain being very important uh, when the country was reopening in the UK. Yeah. To- when who was to know what was coming around the corner, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the closeness of all those bodies, which is, you know, difficult yeah. to find these days. Yeah, and I, I do think that Vortex connects also to your photographs of the late 90s of Mexico City shot in helicopter mm, and for mm. sure it's to this crazy experience that one can have in Mexico City. And mm. now, um, what about you, Mario? You were born in Monclova. We've already said that Monclova is located way up north in Mexico uh, in the desert in the state of Coahuila and uh, really different from the urban uh, a jungle that is Mexico City. How has a uh, living there affected your work? You mean you mean living in Monclova? No, in Mexico City. This oh, program is about oh. the Mexico City. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, <laughs> we'll talk sorry, about sorry. Monclova over beer some other day. <laughs> well, it, well, that's a pity. Uh, 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 well, I mean, it's it's funny that uh, that Melanie talks about distance because I think that's been that's been a, a very important. Uh, uh, Thing also that I have been dealing with, I think. Uh, first of all, before before going to, to Mexico City, it was very clear to me that I had to go to that place, right? Like in Mexico City, the infrastructure in Mexico really leads to very few points in the country where one can actually develop a, 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 a practice, um, or, you know, to be in touch in, with the art world, which I think is one of the main... So, so I always saw that as a, as a distance that made me do a number of works or provoke a number of works. Um, but leaving it, so I, I've been in Mexico City a couple of, I have had two different lives, I think, in Mexico City. I lived there for uh, a number of years and then I left uh, to Los Angeles for a number of years and, and now I'm, I'm back. 
So I think I, I, I have to make the distinction because I think those two moments had a very different influence in my work in that sense. I think when, when, when I came first in my first trip, uh, it was very rewarding to, to find the number of artists who were doing and thinking in the same way, people who were, were also invested in conceptual art ideas. So that was, I found the number of artists who were there and I could talk about them. And so that was really rewarding and very kind of home, homecoming. So that really created some kind of comfort for me to develop those kinds of, kind of ideas. Um, and uh, so that was, that was really interesting. And, but that also, that same thing made me, made me, made me leave as well, because uh, by the time that Mexico City started to be kind of hype in the art world and people will come to, to Mexico to find what they thought Mexican art was, uh, I was not fulfilling that. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I gotta get out of this place. So I left uh, 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 on a Humex uh, grant uh, to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to start in LA. And, 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 and I develop, I, I mean, I, I, I think that many things mature in my work when I was in LA and I started to show uh, uh, more, more often. And uh, but I think that one thing that really uh, is becoming a very important part of my work is now that I, I when I when I was in LA I realized that I was very lonely, uh, very lonely in terms of art. I think that there is some works of mine that you can tell that thinking wise it, it, was, it was it was a very lonely practice. And at some point I realized that it was part of part of the reasons why uh, we moved back to Mexico. And, yeah. and we moved back to Mexico because I, I thought, and I, I think that is really interesting, and I think it's a feature, important feature of Mexico, which is that our works and ideas are discussed and are produced in the street. Uh, the, you know, you, you go to a party, you go to a gathering, you bump into people and you, 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 you share your ideas. And those ideas get built with other people and they connect you to other people. So, so my work since then has been... Um, growing exponentially in terms of collaborations. And I, I've, I've also understood that my work is, is not a one, one people uh, dicta dictation, but it's more like a platform for things to happen. So, so I was very clear that Mexico City would allow me to do that and, to, and to quest, even to question myself, question my own work, question my own resolutions. How do, I, how do I explain this problem? How do I resolve this? And I don't want to do it by myself. I want to know more people and, and involve yeah. All, all the subjectivities involved them in the work. So, so I think that's been very important as well. I think that it's actually quite a, an interesting comment. And I would say that very much of that community uh, was built pretty much in the 90s, although reflected by you uh, just after you returned from LA. And uh, in any case, connecting also the artistic community that Melanie was able to be part of and help shape uh, during the 90s. That was quite relevant, I would say, in terms of the expansion of of art uh, through installation and performance and film and a multidisciplinary practice. But I actually want to go uh, back to hear you speak about one work in particular, Mario, uh, which is Open Letter to Dr. Atel, which I love. And this is a work that reflects that solitude that you're speaking about right now uh, of being in LA. It's an artwork that you made about Mexico while being in Los Angeles. And it's a very important work in your practice for a number of reasons. And uh, taking further on epistolarity, a uh, voiceover, and for sure, uh, the institutional transformation of the uh, artistic community and infrastructure for culture in Mexico is pretty much captured in this film, both through modern art in Mexico and contemporary art and its institutions. So can you speak a little bit about this work, uh, which we're looking at right now in slides, and just tell us a little bit about how it raises some of the questions of history eh, or so-called truth that you have explored in your work. Because for sure, I definitely want to get back to not so much the art world, but the community that forms the collaborations and the spirit of Mexico's eh, hospitality culture at large. Eh, but let's, let's just hear you speak of eh, Dr. Atel and the open letter to him as one of your key artworks. Um, yeah, well, that's that's a piece uh, that I made, uh, as you said. Well, uh, being being living in Los Angeles, I at the time I uh, it was a piece that I made with a lot of urgency. It was a piece that mm -hmm. that was meant to resolve a very specific problem, and that problem was that I that it seemed that the plans to establish a Guggenheim museum in Mexico were were uh, getting very serious, 
And, and I was, uh, at some point I had a very, at, at, at the beginning, I, I thought it would be interesting to, to create a little documentary, a little documentary about a, a museum that didn't exist yet. And, and, and with that idea, I flew to, to Guadalajara where the museum was going to be established. And uh, with the knowledge and the ideas and the interviews of, of architects and, and the people who were involved. And, and while well, being in Los Angeles, I was aware that, that I, I, di I didn't think that was a good idea, and, uh, it, which we could talk for a long time, but it, it, you know, it would have taken uh, the, the, the whole budget that the, that the country spends in culture, it would have taken just to maintain this museum. So I was like, I was like no, this shouldn't, shouldn't happen. So I went down to Guadalajara and tried to, to talk to my colleagues there, friends and artist friends, and, but I realized that nobody shared my, my, my ideas. Like they were all happy. Uh, so, so I, I, I had to, so I had to, I, I shot a little bit of film in the, in the landscape, the background of the museum, what the museum was going to be, what was going to be set up. Uh, at some point, the director of the Guggenheim Museum was, had talked about this, how the, how the, the landscaping in Jalisco, in Guadalajara, was going to be a postcard for the Guggenheim. So I was really invested in what that meant, how that landscape was going to be used in a different way. Well, this is interesting. You know, it's, who have you, so I, I questioned myself, who have used this landscape before? For what purposes? You know, with what, with what uh, ideas? And, and so I went back to Los Angeles with a, with a, with a roll of, of film of the landscape and thinking like, you know, make a, a, my, the piece. That, so I, I had no resource to, to write a letter to a colleague, uh, 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 an, an artist that had died before, and, but who had painted that landscape. So I, uh, I wrote a letter to him explaining, Dr. Atla explaining what was happening. And I, I just placed the, the letter in, in the form of subtitles on top of the footage. And, uh, and that's it, that's, that's what it is. Well, it, it it's, was, it's a piece. It's a piece that it's a piece that, that, that it's interesting. I think that because it's a piece that was meant was was done with a very specific urgency to be shown to my friends in Guadalajara and say, listen, let's discuss this. And uh, but it's it's also a piece, as you said, it's, a, it's, an, it's been an important piece in my work that has been traveling a lot. So it's been really interesting to sort of uh, create that connection on how a very specific urgency in Mexico sort of became. Uh, an echo in different parts of the world. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. And I think that part of it also has to do with unearthing a, an artist himself that is a, who the letter is addressed to, open letter, that was, a, you know, an artist, a landscape painter, a vol volcano, volcano expert, a lover of a modern art, meaning he's a, an emblematic figure that it was positioned to also understand gentrification. And as uh, Mexico has developed a uh, no Guggenheim in sight, uh, certainly Museo Humex, very well positioned. I wanna come back to Eugenio and ask him a question. Uh, he's been following uh, the Mexican art scene for so many years. Uh, and now with the museum has been, yeah, you've been very much uh, connected to also public reception of your collection and a, through the grants program of the foundation Fundacion Jumex also getting a sense of a, you know, what the ideas are of artists and curators. So Eugenio, how do you see the future of Mexican art? A, having wonderful a, spoken a, Mario and Melanie here with us, a, tell us about a, you. I mean, I think that the future for sure is of all these artists a, that are intellectuals and wary you know, amazing craftsmen and uh, creative people. But tell me, what are your views of the future of Mexican art? More than Mexican art, mm -hmm. I see it as a Latin American art. Okay. I, Mexico, when you put boundaries in, in European art, American art, Asian art, that's something that I don't like, but Latin American art. And uh, there, there has been so many things that I have learned throughout the years, in the past 12 years, about minimal art from Brazil, from Colombia, from Venezuela. 
Venezuela, from so many artists that I, I was only aware about European artists, American artists, Donald Judd and Flavin. This, and there has been so many important artists. How do I see the future? That is a very, it all depends on, on how galleries, museums, curators look at it. Uh, I don't think it's discrimination towards that. It was just something that they were not aware or, or they were aware, but now it's changing. And uh, 25 years ago, 1995, my God, it was completely a, a, a different era of, of Mexican art. Mexican artists, they came a long period. But if you see the artists from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, nothing happened to them. What do I mean by it happened? No, I'm not talking about price wise. No, 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 no. I'm talking about exhibitions. Uh, to uh, to me in in interna in museums outside of Mexico, uh, the people to be aware of, as an artist, I think that uh, the most important thing is recognition is incredible, but at least to be aware that what is going on, and there's incredible artists in any field, like actors or actresses that sometimes they do a big time and, and, and there's so much talent in Latin America. Yeah. There's so much talent in, I suppose, China, which I have not been and I have to go because among 1.8 billion people, there has to be talent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's been in India, it is just a matter of how curators, institutions, collectors, and their own peers approach them. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting because uh, I do feel that art uh, in Mexico and artists are incredibly intelligent and no less very much connected to the history of Latin American art at large. It's a, it's a region of much creativity and struggle. And uh, it is an ecosystem that is needed uh, or it takes a village, right? To really uh, support and give them the platforms and the support uh, that they need for the public to encounter their work and to rethink the importance of art uh, for the advancement of culture. And uh, I can't wait to go back to Mexico and see some artists. So I'm gonna ask Kit uh, now to see if there are any artists in Mexico uh, that you're excited about right now that you're working with or art scenes that you are uh, interested in visiting uh, art communities that you want to connect with uh, within Mexico and perhaps even connected uh, in Mexico but maybe they're even from abroad some recommendations some tips Kid, be careful, back. kid, be careful, be careful, be careful. It's gonna because we're gonna leave people out of the list. <laughs> no, I, I can mention some of the artists who are actually yeah. in the exhibition because one of the things we um, deliberately looked for uh, was to move outside of just focusing on Mexico City because Great. increasingly I think um, people are choosing to live in other regions and have very different connections. Um, there's an artist in a younger artist in the exhibition, Julieta Aguinalco, mm -hmm. who's based in Baja, California. Mm. Um, Lorena Ancona, who made a really fantastic work uh, for us, who's um, based in the Yucatan. And interestingly, there seems to be a move to, um, with these artists to not necessarily focus their attention through Mexico City, but build connections elsewhere. So. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's quite vital at the moment to look beyond Mexico City, uh, even beyond the major and cities such as Guadalajara, and Monterrey, to yeah. other regions. Sonora has an artistic community um, that really has connections beyond the border. 
Sophia, can I say yeah. something else? Yeah. It is so important how many international artists have come to live in Mexico City. Here we have our Melanie Smith. Kid is here. And these are international people, which before, and there's so many young artists that they want, they say Mexico City is the most energetic city in the world, right now. And they're moving to Mexico City and, they're, and they loved it. The fact to have English artists, artists from Belgium, from Holland, from, from Thailand, from anywhere, and that they creating the work in Mexico, in their studios. And there's so many galleries representing them and, 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 and gambling, because it's a gamble, not gambling. What I'm trying to say is when you take an artist and then you present them to, to everything is important, you know? And there's the younger generations they want to live in Mexico or they come and they spend time. And that is fantastic. It is something that I've not seen in, well, 20 years. <laughs> in the past three, four years, everything has helped. Galleries, Sonamaco, maybe Museum Humex, maybe curators, but the eyes, of the outside world yeah. are coming to Mexico. I think that it's a very noted what you're saying. And I think that it does have to do with the experience of Melanie that has been socialized uh, for many of us that have grown up in Mexico. And also the experience of Mario that is very much about uh, building through community and with community, the work. It's a very collaborative society and it's very community oriented in general. And artists are an emblematic uh, aspect of this. So artists from abroad who feel lonely or from the interior of the country. I think the, the nice example that Kid is also bringing is that it's not just about Mexico City, but also artists are choosing to live in their own states eh, and we need more support for, the, eh, for El Interior so that eh, artists can help build their eh, communities of thought. Now, we have a couple of questions from the audience and our time really is running out. We have a couple of minutes, but there's one question that is, a, you know, that has been raised by the public for all of us and for you specifically as participants, but it's actually a, a question that I would like to hear a, first the artist response to, maybe we begin with Melanie. And it's a question on the way a, an audience member would like to see a, or hear from your thoughts on the way in which the history of 20th century politics in Mexico has played out in the work being made now. Now, note, it's not about 21st century politics, 20th century politics, <laughs> which I think is very important. <laughs> so let's not talk about the 21st century, but in what way the history of 20th century politics uh, impacted uh, artistic production today. And I think that it's quite relevant because uh, Eugenio has spoken about the importance of the 90s, but we also have that it's a century of a lot of dictatorships coming down in Latin America and certainly the revolution in our country at the start of the 20th century uh, play a fundamental role uh, in artist uh, practice and making at the latter part of the, yeah, the turn of the 21st century. So Melanie, what are your thoughts? How has a uh, politics played a role or the history of politics played a role in your work? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, um, uh, I guess, I think you were kind of, edging towards the Aztec Stadium, but <laughs> uh, because that, you know, I mean, that for me, which was kind of um, a piece which was done within the context of the 2010 so-called Bicentenary celebrations, which I was somehow kind of been uh, connecting. It was a, you know, a massive piece, which I made in the Aztec Stadium with 3000 people with using the um, red square of Malievich in the middle. So, um, using people as a kind of, to, go, to kind of form this red square. So I was kind of, you know, yes, I've definitely been thinking a lot about how, um, you know, different histories, different modernities connect with Mexican modernity. You know, um, uh, I quite often use, you know, like 
specific sites, in that case, the Aztec Stadium, which was made by Pedro Ramirez Vasquez as a, you know, center of power, mm -hmm. uh, political power, um, you know, in the, in the first part of the, of the, of the well, the second part of the 20th century. Then I've got really involved with dissecting Diego Rivera, which is a pretty dangerous thing to do. But, you know, I've, um, you know, been um, kind of um, critiquing um, his murals in, dare I say it, a kind of, yeah, a kind of, uh, in a way, a sort of feminist uh, way by, you know, um, uh, just kind of really defragment or fragmenting um, um, this kind of very, you know, powerful sense of Diego Rivera's playing out of the Mexican Revolution. You know, it, it comes through my work, I suppose, through more through art history. But, you know, obviously those two things are totally connected through, you know, um, um, politics and not, you know, art history going hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, Mario, do you want to speak a, to this uh, question from the public? Oh, well, that <clears throat> seems like, uh, you know, we could talk uh, hours about, about the influence of, of politics in art for sure. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I would say that there's one, one. I mean, I, you know, the history. When you look at the history of, of Mexican art, uh, uh, what or the art that has been produced in Mexico, have been, I think, defined always. If if it if it might be more relevant to talk about this, about the the distance between or the relationship, the political relationship of Mexico with other countries. So you know, like when 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 uh, um, uh, when you look at the art from 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 the early century, like 1910s, 1920s. It was, a, it was a work that was very much connected to uh, European mo modernism and, and, and with uh, you know, what was happening at the same time in, in Venezuela or, or, or in Argentina. And it was a, it was a very clear di international discussion. And then we had this, this uh, 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 gap of, of the muralists who, uh, because of politics, uh, they needed to define what our identity was, which you, know, we, you might be in agreement or not, but we had this gap of uh, radical revolutionary art and by the time uh, of the 50s, 60s, slowly, sl slowly, uh, the, the other ideas that were caught up in the 20s were, uh, came up again and where we started to, again to get be, to be connected to the world in that sense. So I think that, you know, you, we could talk forever, but I think that it's, it, that, that, that to me is very interesting, the relationship between uh, the exterior politics and how that yeah. has been influenced. I think that it's quite interesting. In preparation for this program, Kit and I were discussing the exhibition at PS1, uh, of which Melanie Smith's work is actually the cover of the exhibition catalog, an exhibition 20 years ago curated by Klaus Biesenbach and with contributions from Patricia Martin, the then curator of uh, Fundación Jumex, and a, a major a voice in defining what the collection would be, and Cuauhtémoc Medina. So just to even think of the idea of finding these three people collaborating again is daunting. But uh, what is incredible is that these uh, three people with great minds were able to articulate the moment of the, the political context of Mexico at that time, saying that an exhibition of that kind had not taken place in New York since the Tamayo retrospective at the Metropolitan had occurred as part of the also you know, independence a anniversary of, I don't know how many years. And so it was a framed already as an exhibition, a very much like the one of Kit about a, a kind of other narratives that are not the institutional narratives that are taking place regardless of the presence or infrastructure of the state. A, and in that way, defining itself in con the artistic community in contraposition to the official discourse of the political history that had been promoted uh, for a large part of the 20th century. So I think that it's, it's a very pertinent question from the audience that has come in. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, and I am a, you know, there's more questions and those are to Eugenio about his collecting practice in the future of Museo Humex that could be responded by kid via email uh, or phone calls maybe and by Eugenio uh, in a coffee or two. I think that this has been a wonderful evening uh, already when Kit has introduced us to the exhibition at Mujer Humex.
Eugenio has introduced us to his a startup of a thinking through the arts and falling into passion. And to Patricia Martin, Patricia Martin was a key person. Key person. Person. Key for someone mm -hmm. incredible, incredible, and it is some, something that you will always rem remember: the people and smart, incredible yeah. curator, incredible, and Keith, whom I have here. <laughs> I, and, and you had to you, yeah. all of you. You've had wonderful curators, Kit Now, Julieta Gonzalez, Magalia Reolia, Patrick Charpenel, Patricia Martin, and we have two wonderful artists, uh, Melanie Smith and Mario Garcia Torres, to thank uh, for these wonderful presentations about their artistic practice and the distance and proximity that you have with Mexico. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. To the public uh, in this part of the world that is up late, and to those spending the afternoon with us online on Zoom, Uh, I'm very, very pleased to listen to you all and hopefully there will be another occasion to gather and talk politics.